Hello and welcome to the Spirit Guides podcast with your host, Mark Chatterton. Today, I am pleased to welcome on board from the USA filmmaker, author and musician, Richard Martini. Rich has been involved in directing and making films in Hollywood for several years now, including You Can't Hurry Love, Point of Betrayal and My Beloved, My Bollywood Bride. Sorry. In 2012, he directed a documentary on the work of Michael Newton on past life regression. And it is through his work in filming past life regression sessions that he's become involved in the world of the afterlife, or the flip side, as he calls it. As a result, he has written and published six books on this subject. His first book, Flip Side, A Tourist Guide on How to Navigate the Afterlife, became a bestseller on Amazon. He has recently released his sixth book, entitled Architecture of the Afterlife, The Flip Side Code, Discovering the Blueprint for the Great Beyond. He also regularly has a Hacking the Afterlife podcast, which you can see on his in his website called The Martini Shot. And I think you would agree that Rich has plenty of different experiences to talk about. So a warm welcome to the show, Rich. Thank you, Mark. Very kind of you. I appreciate that. It was a wonder. I always love to hear what, you know, <laughs> who, am, who is this guy? What? How did yeah. he get on my podcast? <laughs> um, you know, and uh, it's funny because it's actually eight books. I, it sounds silly. Sorry, but I, I miscounted. I no, no, it's only because there's six titles. There's, uh, you know. Right. It's a Wonderful yeah. Afterlife has two volumes, and so I, I think of it as eight, but it, you're right. It's six titles. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. you know, people ask, I'm on Quora quite a bit, and people ask me there all the time, like, why are you doing this? Why are you wasting your time? You know, why aren't yeah. you pursuing Hollywood stuff? And I've learned our guides, since you're a spirit guide guy, our guides have a really, they do a really good job of putting in front of us you know, the stuff that we're supposed to be doing. I'm, And, of course, we have free will, so we can bat that away and say, no, 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 I have to, I must, I'm going to make a billion dollars, you know, whatever it is. And we pursue, 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 and then we eventually get to the end of the bus ride, and we look around and we go, okay, you know, did we get where we wanted to go? So I can only say that had I had a successful career as a filmmaker, we wouldn't be talking. No, no. Let, let's start with how, how did you actually get involved? You actually filmed these past life re regressions and you've done over 50, I understand. Now yeah, that's today. right. So, that's so right. how do you get involved with it? Well, I just to clarify, I've done 100 to date. Yeah. 50 are with hypnotherapists doing uh, deep hypnosis and 50 yeah. are with people like yourself um, lives on a broad Cast or but you know blog whatever it's called podcast or blog or radio or television it doesn't matter or on a coffee shop where I'm just talking to somebody chatting with them casually and they start to access these things but in a nutshell how I got involved was a friend of mine died started showing up and I was you know I could convince that I was making that up. But she was giving me new information, things I couldn't know, couldn't be cryptomnesia, things about herself, things about me. And instead of ignoring that, by adding that away, I started to examine it. And that took me in quite a few places because she had been a Buddhist. I started studying Tibetan philosophy. But eventually I got to the work of Michael Newton. In a roundabout way, I was in London. I met an Oxford professor, shook his hand, heard a voice in my head say, this is why you're in London. And then six months later, he was the person who turned me on to Michael Newton's work. And I saw that Michael Newton was doing a talk. No, nah, uh, what do you call it? A workshop in Chicago, my hometown. And I reached out to them and said, I'd like to make a documentary about this topic. People under hypnosis claiming, mm. skeptic, jaded Hollywood guy, claiming <laughs> to be able to access the afterlife. And to my shock and surprise and dismay, uh, they said, sure, come come to Chicago. And so I filmed Michael Newton's last interview, um, even though this was like 2008. He passed away in 16. But I, um, they gave me free and full, unfettered access to everything they were doing. And I started filming people under deep hypnosis and saying to myself, like, how can this be? 
that these people are saying the same things which are contrary to religious beliefs, to religious tenets, contrary to scientific thought or theory, but consistent, contrary, but consistent. And after about a week of filming people, they said, why don't you try one? And I thought, great, I can prove this fake, false, not true. I don't mm. believe in the afterlife. I'm, I don't think I can be hypnotized. You know, I got a monkey mind. It's all over the place. I drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not what happened. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I allowed that whatever was going to happen, I was going to be truthful about it. And I turned the camera on. And if I didn't see anything, you know, if they said, what do you see? I was not going to oblige them with something made up. I was going to say, I don't see anything. I see darkness. I was going to say it for four hours if I had to. But they assigned a hypnotherapist who was really good with me. And uh, within about, I don't know, maybe half an hour, 45 minutes, I was seeing all kinds of things, talking to all kinds of people, consciously saying, I must be making this up. And, but allowing myself to say, oh, this is what this means. This is who that is. Oh, here's my friend who passed away so many years ago. And now we're talking about this and she's showing me this new information. So I realized it's related to, and if I can just make this little side turn here for a second, it's related to consciousness, how consciousness functions in the human brain. And for a good uh, overview of that, I recommend to people to take a look at Dr. Bruce Grayson's um, YouTube talk. It's called, Is Consciousness Produced by the Brain? I interviewed Dr. Grayson, I stayed at his house, he allowed me to, um, to excerpt that and publish it in my book, It's a Wonderful Afterlife. But in it, he talks about the medical evidence that d demonstrates clearly that people without functioning brains are still able to function. Yep. Not only near-death experiences, but also in the UK, these hospice care workers who report that 70% of their uh, patients suddenly spontaneously recover their memories just prior to death. As if, and Dr. Grayson put it this way, as if the filters had died yeah, along yeah. with the brain. And then I started finding filter references in Dr. Helen Wamba's work, a um, clinical psychologist working in San Francisco in the 1970s, who prior to Michael Newton had done the exact same research, but in a more clinical way with clients and patients and data. And her results are identical to the ones that I've been doing. So that first time that I filmed myself under deep hypnosis, quote unquote, you're never under, having memories and speaking to people on the other side, it was like the Earth's axis had shifted slightly. When I came out of that session, it was like everything I had been told or believed was inaccurate. Yeah. yeah. And it shifted enough that I thought, well, I've got to examine this. Yeah. Um, so, so I found a guy out here in Los Angeles, a guy named Scott DeTamble. Are we back? Yeah, yeah we're back. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, it's all right. I always think, you know, is someone editing me? <laughs> they go, <laughs> don't talk about this. Just get yeah. down. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, that's what they're saying. Stop talking. Let Mark talk. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, because you, you come from a catholic background so obviously um i i take it you were quite skeptical at first and you <laughs> um well that's a misnomer catholic guilt not only do i come from a catholic background mark yeah once you read architecture of the afterlife you're going to realize i come from a really catholic background yeah. and i mean a background so when i was baptized in this life you know, I had a priest who tried to molest me. I had a priest that was, like, annoying. I had a priest who punched me in the mouth. Catholicism and I didn't get along at all. Mm. I dismissed the church when I was about eight years old, when I went to my parents and said, the Bible's a metaphor, isn't it? And they were like, <laughs> yeah, it is. And I went, okay, what are we doing here? <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a short answer yeah, for a yeah, long yeah, topic. Sure. Yeah. But, but I would just say I was... Not anti-Catholic, but anti-concept for yeah. a long time. Until, if you want to go here, until that fella, 
yeah. who people claim to die on the cross started showing up in the research. And at first it was like, oh, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> you, mm. whoever you are, too much. Step aside. And then yeah. after really, I don't know, maybe a dozen people, people I'd never met before, people I knew, suddenly are saying, you know, I'm seeing. Wait, so yeah. I, it's when I was writing Hacking the Afterlife, I had some really, that was my fourth book. I had some very unusual things that I wanted to, I thought I have to address these. Yeah. So in Hacking the Afterlife for the first time, well, I actually mentioned it in Flipside, but in Hacking the Afterlife, a third of the book are these reports of the avatar known as Jesus yeah. showing up in a lot of variety of different ways. Is that something you wanted to talk yeah, about? I've, I don't know. Yeah, I've actually read, read all that, and I, that's what I want to talk about, part of the stuff, yeah. Sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so let me um, ask you, Mark, yeah. let's ask about your journey. Yeah. How did you come to this work? Well, I came from quite a religious background. Um, my mother was Catholic and my father was Protestant. So uh, quite a mixture there. One. OK, your father. Uh, I'm sorry. Your mother was yeah, Catholic and your father was Protestant. So okay. um, I'm from a, a mixture of things. But I was brought up in the high side, the Catholic side of the Church of England, if you can understand that. I got high. You were brought up right. high. Did I, you say? I was brought on the Anglo-Catholic side of the Protest of the Church of England, which is a Protestant okay, side. Sure. But I was um, I was actually a, a choir boy, and um, then I became an altar boy, and so on. And then in my teens, I went from one extreme to the other and became a, a evangelical Christian. Oh, <laughs> I thought, I thought <laughs> you were going to go into yeah, you know, drug use. No, no, evangelical. Yeah. Okay, very good. But um, that was in the 70s, and I, I was so into it, I actually read theology at Oxford University. Cool. <laughs> you can hear me, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and at one stage, I was going to become a priest, and then um, the minute I left university, it all just went, and then I didn't believe that anymore. And ever wow. since, for the last 40 years, I've been sort of researching, reading, asking the questions about truth and looking at different religions and here i am now in very open-minded and in into spirituality if you like that's brilliant i yeah. you know and and thank you for sharing that i appreciate yeah. that well i've actually oh. done an interview on on the spirit guides all about this you'll have to read it sometime listen to oh it i'd love to absolutely yeah. Yeah. i'd love yeah. to you know i would only ask you this um and this is not to parse what we're yeah. talking about mm. it's to open as opposed to parsing, you know, we, yeah, we yeah. tend to label things which puts them in a box so that we can pass them back and forth. Yeah, yeah, but in this yeah. question, uh, I'm asking to open this up, which is, have you done a past life regression? No, this this is something that I'd, I'd like to do. I've, I've got in, you know, I've been reading about not just from your books, but a few other people. I don't know if you've heard of a guy called Joe Steiner at all. Mm. No, no, no. I'll show you. I'll just show you his book if you can see that there. Cool, nice face. Right, <laughs> you're going to show me a similar one. I was going to show you. No, I was going to show you. Uh, this is right. somebody I've been reading quite a bit yeah. about. But yeah. I yeah. want to tell you, her yeah. book. This is Helen Wamba, Doctor Wamba. Okay, right. I yeah. stumbled on her work, mm. and like anything in life, um, yeah. there is no stumbling. There are no coincidences. Yeah, yeah. One of her one of her subjects reached out to me after reading something I had written about her because I read the book and it was like, oh my God, 1970. She was saying the exact same things everybody in my research was saying, as well yeah, as all yeah. the new people. And so on Martini Zone, which is uh, the video for portion of my world, richmartini.com is my website, but martinizone.com is on YouTube. And I just posted this last week. It's a three-hour video. Um, and it's not a video because it's just audio. But somebody reached out to me and sent me one of her sessions. Yeah. And yeah. it's very old school, the, you know, the way she talks. But it's three hours of a past life regressionist doing a session and, and, and telling you and asking you to access these memories. And, yeah. and all I can say is, it's not an individual session, which is something you and I can do right here yeah, live yeah. air if mm. we wanted to. 
But it's something anybody can do. You just sit and listen to it for three hours and write down what impressions you get. Yeah, yeah. And that's a way to access what we were talking about earlier, S moving the filters aside yeah. so that you can access some memories. And, of course, your guides. I mean, you probably have heard this before. Or your guides won't let you see things that are problematic or disturbing yeah. unless it's to wake you up. Yeah. So, so, yeah. and but I would say this, which is talking to you just for the few moments that we've spoken. I would say, well, here's a guy <laughs> who probably had a previous lifetime of the cloth. Yeah. It could have been any religion. Let's not parse it that way. Yeah. It's likely a Christian one, but let's not even bother with that. Mm. Because once you get the robe on, you know, all the rules go out the window. Yeah, Everybody yeah. stops talking about the philosophical and they start telling you about, you know, how to kneel, yeah, as we know. But in my own case, in Architecture of the Afterlife, which you haven't gotten to yet, but you will eventually, mm. take your time. There's a very unusual um, chapter called The Saint. Yeah. And it, it relates to a past life regression I had. Um, it was my sixth, so it was yeah. like at least 10 years after I started this research. So it's, you, you think, well, this was like a pretty important detail. Why would I leave it out? Mm. And you realize your guides show you things in the order you're supposed to get them. Mm. If I had seen this recalled lifetime of, Flor of a, a Dominican priest in Florence in, in the 15th century, I would have just would have blown my mind. I wouldn't have been able to parse it or or even talk about it. But now that I've been doing all this other stuff, I get to it. I go, oh, of course, totally makes sense. Hence, why certain dreams of mine have been in Latin, not yeah, because yeah. of a life in the Roman era, mm. but because of a life of a guy who used to write in Latin yeah. about these yeah. topics. Yeah. Because I also know that you did a past life regression where you discovered you were a, a Buddhist monk in Tibet as well. A past life regression where I what? What did I you do? Were, you were a Buddhist monk in Tibet. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, in yeah. the 1600s. <laughs> yeah. You know, and what's interesting about that, I was thinking about it the other day. Because, you know, listen, I deal with this topic a lot. And people ask me, how do you know? How do you know that this wasn't made up and invented? I mean, I've been to Tibet. I've been to Lhasa. I've been to the locations that I recalled, let's say. So how do I know I'm not just convoluting it? And it was a, a moment when I said, I know what it's like to be old. I mean, I'm old now, but I'm not, you know, ancient. Mm -hmm. And this Lama was an ancient fella. And as I was observing him, I... I remember what it was like to be old and have no one around that has your references. That the loneliness of old age isn't just your friends are all gone, which is true, but the people who understand your references, your jokes, yeah. can't make a joke if people don't get the reference, are gone. And so the loneliness of old age, something I have never experienced and don't know anything about, was clear to me. So when I when I... When I look back on past life information, I try to focus on new information, something you couldn't have known. How could I know what it's like to be lonely as an old man other than my life, I'm just saying. But you know what I mean. So those kinds yeah. of details, and I was thinking about this llama just the other day because I was thinking, you know, what was, the, what, were, what was the theme of that guy's life? And it was that he, he, when he was younger, he hated his teachers. He thought they were idiots. I, have, I remember that feeling. Like, yeah. oh my God, this guy didn't know what he's talking about. And then finding a teacher that he connected to who understood him and that feeling of, you know, having a teacher who looks you in the eye and goes, I get you. Wow, that was powerful. You know, I can yeah, almost yeah. Feel, remember it now. And then going through that life and then, you know, the last moments of that life. And I recalled as that guy, you know, coughing, hacking, just having a terrible emphysema-like cough, that kind of weird cough that rattles and yeah. everybody can hear it in the monastery because it echoes everywhere. And it's like, shut up! <laughs> and, and then expiring and then getting up 
yep. getting up out of the bed, going to the attendant's room, and blowing out a can his candle to let him know I had passed. Yeah, patting yeah. him on the head. Thank you, thanking him for his service. Yeah, yeah. Those kinds of things, I I have even as a screenwriter. You I, actually went to Tibet in tw- tw- two thousand six to do a, a documentary with um, the Buddhist scholar Robert Thurman, the the father of actress Una Thurman, and you've also went to you did a documentary on Tibetans in exile in Dharman Shala in India. Um, so you you obviously had a connection with Tibet without realizing it, perhaps, would you say? Well, yes and no. So yeah. how did this happen? I can tell you. I was on a plane. So my friend died, the one who came to visit me. Yeah. Her name is Luana Anders, and she shows up quite a bit in my books with Jennifer Schaefer, the medium I work with. Yeah. Because yeah. Luana is our helper guide in our work. She's over there. Uh, corralling and rallying and uh, pulling together our classroom. But at the time, Luana had passed away in 1996, and our f- mutual friend, Charles Grodin, the actor, um, who she introduced me to, they were best pet friends, he invited me to come and produce his show. And on the plane to New York, New York Times Sunday edition, magazine, I opened it up and there was an article about Robert Thurman, talking about how when his teacher had died, he had reincarnated as a young boy in Dharamsala, uh, and he had gone to visit this five-year-old. And he said he didn't tell anybody he was coming. He was sitting in the patio, and the kid was riding that one of those tricycles, that are the kind that was in The Shining, and rode around in a circle. So he's watching this former teacher of his, now a five-year-old, r- riding in a circle. Kid rides out to his foot, stops the bike, looks at him and says, Thurman, why did you leave the monkhood? You so disappointed me. (laughs) And Thurman said it was startling because he looked just like his teacher. Mm. He didn't tell anybody his name. And when I read that, I thought, oh, here's (laughs) a guy who knows why my friend has been coming to visit me. That's what I thought. So I got to work at NBC, and I contacted Thurman, and I said, "Um, can I audit your class? And he said, oh, no, it's a a philosophy class for PhD candidates. Uh, How familiar are are you with Hegel and Kant, he said. And I said, they play for the 49ers. Come on, (laughs) Bob. And I wouldn't take no for an answer. So he let me audit the class. And sometimes in life you meet people whose minds are just, you know, way in the other zone. He's one of them. And I went to India with him uh, and his wife, Nena, became friends. And then at some point I was making this Bollywood movie and I said, I wrote to him, I said, hey, if you're ever taking a trip. So I wrote him an email and I said, Bob, if you're ever going to uh, Tibet again, I'd I'd be happy to film it for Tibet House. I'll film the journey. And uh, I got this email. I'm on a movie set in Juhu in Bombay. And it said, if you can be in Kathmandu on Tuesday, you can film our next trip around Kailash, which, you know, two months in Tibet with Robert Thurman. It's online for free. Anybody can tune in to Journey into Tibet with Robert Thurman. But I was sitting on the tarmac and the plane and thinking, how the hell did this happen? How did I get here? I'm here. (laughs) And then... And then, you know, you have this experience of being home. And you're like, home? I've never been here. I've, hmm. How could this be? And as we went all across Tibet, I had that feeling over and over again, f- made these films, and ultimately, and it was because my friend, oh, I forgot to add, when I read that thing about Thurman, my friend who died was a Buddhist. Yeah, yeah. She was a, a Nichiren, Shoshu Buddhist. But I thought, Thurman, Buddhist? Luana, Buddhist, maybe if I study Buddhism, there's an answer to how consciousness exists after we die. Now, every Buddhist watching this will say, there is no self, there is no, you don't exist between lies, you're a wisp of smoke. That's the, that's the belief. Yeah. It's just not in the research. Because when I got to Tibet, and when I did this research, and when I went around and visited all these things, and remembered things, I... 
I had had an experience, and people who've read Flipside know this, where my friend Luana pulled me out of my body into an out-of-body experience and took me to the realm she's in and showed it to me. And she said to me, you were looking for me. This is where I am. Because I had been wondering, well, where are you? If you can yeah. visit me, how do I visit you? I was fully conscious when that happened. And so the idea that between lives we're not fully conscious, we're not aware, we're a wisp of smoke, is just not in the research. So you see, I went with Thurman. I did that thing. I studied the philosophy. I found it didn't have the answers. And eventually it took me to this Oxford professor, Robert Beer. So which takes us back to you, Mr. <laughs> Theology. <laughs> And so, so there's a connection there straight away, isn't there? Oxford? Absolutely. And yeah, and the yeah. qu the question is, my question to you would be, who is it on the flip side? Yeah. Is it your higher self? Is it a guide? Is it a teacher? Is it Aunt Betty who wants you to explore this stuff for you to act? Or maybe you're just healing people. Maybe they just want you to sh share this information so people out there listening in can be healed what do you think it is um well I, i've i've explored that to be honest with you and and i'm not sort of going to say it's that or that i'm you know i'm sort of fairly open-minded on that at the moment um i tend to be quite flexible in my thinking if you like i don't say this is this is the answer or that's the answer you know I, maybe i'm sitting yeah. on the fence i don't know but um you know, this right. is perhaps perhaps why I do this. And, I'm, you know, as, as I said, I've interviewed quite a few different people, spiritual teachers, and, you know, I, I'm getting a, quite a wide range of, of answers and things. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I would, if I can, based on the research and based on mm. talking to a lot of people, yeah. when I film people talking about this, about their journey in this life, doctors, yeah. teachers, nurses mm. especially, also musicians, artists, creative people, mm. They often say that the healing light of the universe is almost on the same frequency that creativity is. It's literally like side by side. So people who choose lifetimes of healers, shamans, doctors, whatever it is, they're sharing that light of the universe, whatever you, if you want to call it, that energy of the universe yeah, with, yeah. with others to heal them. So when I meet a nurse, a hospice care nurse, for example, you know, who says, ah, oh, this is weird. You know, the research you're talking about, I've seen it so many times where patients suddenly remember mm. all their children or I even see them go out of their body. And but I'm a scientist and I don't know. I don't know how to reconcile these concepts. I'll tell them. It's unusual you'd say that because most of the people I talk to. They say they should choose lives of healing. You're actually doing this great service to these people as they're leaving the planet. I mean, you're literally guiding them to the garden gate. Yeah. Here's yeah. the gate. Even though you might not understand what's on the other side of the gate, or like you said, I'm on the fence. You can <laughs> see into the distance. But that doesn't mean you don't enjoy life and everything. I mean, eat the pizza. You have the cappuccino. That's why we're <laughs> here. If yeah. it's true that we volunteered to come here, then look around to see who is it that I came to help or heal or teach or learn from or share my pizza with. I mean, that's really the essence of it. When you when I talk to these people who talk about, you know, the choice of their life and how they worked out all the details and they went through all their different lifetimes and they saw what they didn't do and what they want to do. Ultimately, they're here to share, you know, to be connected. And that's one thing also I'd like to mention in this research for somebody out there, especially today's times, depression. Yeah. Um, feeling alone, especially when you have to be alone. Um, you're never alone, ever. You choose to come here. All your guides weighed in on the choice. Some of them were like, no, you can't handle that. You said, yes, I can. I, I'm ready to go back. Let me back in there. Come on, coach. I can get in there and I can mix it up. I can have fun and I will learn the lesson I forgot to learn the last time. Oh. I swear to you, I promise. And when you sort of you become aware of that, whether it's 
through hypnosis, LSD, out-of-body experience, a near-death event. I don't recommend those, but it happens. Mm -hmm. Or even guided meditation, or even just listening to us talk about it and allowing for the possibility that we're saying what we're saying is accurate. That's like opening up the garden gate. And then you stop worrying about things that you don't need to worry about. If what they're saying is true, we don't die. Then there's nothing that can harm us. I mean, we for others and we're like, don't harm our, uh, well, wait a minute, they're not gonna die either. I'm not gonna die, they're not gonna die. Our bodies will stop, but yeah. we go home. And, and it's not like we're floating around, where are we? We go, oh, it's you. Hey, what's happened? I haven't seen you since like six lifetimes ago. What have you been doing since you were a Viking? You know, hmm. we we tend to sort of dismiss all that. But I'm here to say, don't dismiss anything, which is what you're doing. You know, you're basically allowing people to speak their truth. Yeah, yeah. And we're all just walking each other home. What about the idea of... Um people having so many lifetimes and then it all stops and they've reached a, well, as far <laughs> as they can go which is funny yeah. it's like yeah. uh, to me it's like somebody somebody wrote this today in quora i was answering this and he was like what the heck are you talking about we only bring a third of our conscious energy to a lifetime and two-thirds is always back home how do we get on this bus that's what he said mm. yeah not knowing yes. that my and that eventually we the bus stops and the door is open. And what are you going to say other than time to get off the bus? We're off the bus. The, the doors, the driver says, have a nice life. The door is closed. Now what? And you can ask. You can ask guides. I've asked. And the, and the question I asked my guide was, so how would you become a guide? <laughs> Were you always a guide? And... I had the very unusual experience. It was probably my second or third out of six deep hypnosis sessions I filmed. It might have been the second. Where I felt my consciousness whoop, and into my guides. <laughs> what he said was, I had all my lifetimes. And when I graduated from all those lifetimes to become a guide, my graduation gift was Richard. So he's not incarnating anymore, but he's watching over me and probably other people. It's disconcerting to reveal that your guy <laughs> has other clients, yeah. like agents, you know. What? My agent has another client? <laughs> but that's what they say. They just don't talk about their other clients. Because, you know, you'd be saying, what happened? I was begging for your help and you didn't show up. What's the matter with you? I was busy playing cards with Larry over in Vegas. Whatever. So there's a hierarchy, but no hierarchy. People don't consider themselves higher or lower over there. But there is, let's say, a ladder or staircase where people that are incarnating learn all the lessons they want to learn and they volunteer to come here and learn those lessons and help others learn lessons and then they might graduate to being a guide and then they might watch over somebody else's all their freaking lifetimes imagine how boring that will be but they do it because time is different outside of here yeah, yeah. right it's like well it's a big deal yeah i can spare a month to watch over 20 lifetimes a year then they graduate. So guides have guides. Guides have councils. Councils have councils. It keeps going up. In Architecture of the Afterlife, I interview, and I, I must, you know, it has to be 100 council members. I mean, what I'm saying is I'm in a session with somebody just talking about, without any hypnosis, and they're saying, I'm here with a council. There's, if you look up Dr. Drew and Rich Martini on YouTube, you'll find a 15 20 minute conversation where dr drew total atheist skeptic doesn't believe in the afterlife is talking to his counsel and he identifies all 12 of them and he names mm -hmm. them i mean it's a it's mind bending but i've done it so many times it doesn't surprise me at all but i'm interviewing his counsel you see he's not mm -hmm. but he's doing the answers so i yeah. say 
who's the first counselor on the left in your visual? And they'll say, you know, it's a man, a woman, a thing, a being, a light, a lizard, <laughs> or that. I don't judge. It's an angel. I add, Then I ask, so why are you appearing today as this man, woman, whatever? And yeah. then they'll tell me. And then mm -hmm. I'll ask, have you ever incarnated on Earth? And quite a few say no. And I go, so what makes you an expert? If you've <laughs> never even been here, how'd you get on a council? Actually, I don't know if you know Simon Bone, but he's a podcaster in England. And I did a session with him recently live on the air. Yeah. Because he had had an experience of going to his council and they told him to go away. They sent him away. So he wanted to know why that happened. And we went. And I, I ducked him in. I, you know, took a side trip in. We got in. We asked, why did you guys, you know, what was the purpose of allowing him to see his council if you didn't want to talk to him? And one of them said, because I always ask this question to council members, are you aware of my work? It's a weird question. Yeah. Not about me. But I ask. And now here's a person, I've never met them before. They're talking to a council member. I ask the council member, are you aware of my work? The person I'm talking to may not be aware of my work at all. Never read a book, nothing. The council member goes, oh, yeah, we're totally aware of your work. Other council members on the same council may say, nope, never heard of you. Literally two people over. First guy says, yeah, we're aware of you. Two guys later, no, who are you? Weird question, weird answers. But in this one case in Simon Bowen's council, this one of his guys said, oh, yeah, we know you. You're the troublemaker. <laughs> You're the guy who asks a lot of questions, <laughs> which is true. Yeah. And Simon wouldn't know that. You see, I mean, maybe he does. I don't know. Yeah, I, you know, I can't imagine that anybody's read all my books, let alone one. But it's weird. I'm asking somebody on Skype, on whatever, on the radio. They're fully awake. They're having coffee. And then the next thing you know, we're talking to their council. And then I'm asking the council members questions about their journey. Who are they? How did you get to be on this council? What's the quality you represent in this person's spiritual involvement that allowed you to be on this council? Those answers are really unusual, revelatory. Yeah. They talk about the person. They really point to the person's theme of all their lifetime. They're startled to hear an answer. Courage. Really. So you represent courage on this person's council. Was there a lifetime where... That happened, and then suddenly this person is saying, oh, they're showing me, yeah, when I was burned at the stake and whatever, 1,500, blah, 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 blah. And then I looked that up. You know, I write down everything they say. Oh, oh really? Where were you burned at the stake? Uh, Spain, Spain, northern Spain. It's like 14, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then I'm there. Oh, my God. Like 100 witches were burned at the stake one weekend. In mm. this town in Spain. I had yeah. never heard it. I didn't know it. So mm. that's what I'm trying to do is I'm just asking questions. I'm like yourself. I'm a little different than you. You're allowing people to speak their reality. Yeah. But I'm asking the questions. Yeah. That's the only difference. When somebody says, you know, angels are this. You know, this is what an angel is. And then I'll say, okay, well, the angel that you saw that you remember seeing. I mean, I never saw an angel. And you notice whenever I mention the word angel, we freeze? I'm kidding. But, <laughs> what, you know, what's your take uh, on angels then? So what? my take is, is really simple, which is no take. Who are you? What's your story? You know, each one is different. I've talked to, I talked to one the other day. If you go to Martini Zone, last Thursday, I was sleeping. <sighs> Oh, alert the media. Last Thursday, I was in my sleep prior to my session with Jennifer Schaefer, which we do on live online. I had somebody talking to me. I became aware. I don't know if you've had this experience, but you're sleeping and then you're aware you're having a conversation with somebody and you're kind of consciously aware of it, but you realize you're in the middle of the conversation. You don't remember the beginning. And this person was saying, I want to talk to you today. And I said, well, who the heck are you? Who are you? And this person said, I'm 
you can call me the principal. <laughs> and I thought, <clears throat> you know, school setting, you know, the ruler, you're the principal. And I laughed, you know, like, does that mean God or something like that? I don't know. I, but I, I set it aside. And so a couple hours later, I'm talking to Jennifer and I say, so I had this person show up last night. They called themselves the principal. And she said, okay, they're here. They want to talk to us. And in now my friend Luana is assisting. And I say, Luana, is it okay to talk to the principal? Because Luana's got the clipboard that allows people to her class. That's why that's, yeah. it was Tom Petty who came through and said, you don't know how hard it is to get into this class. Your friend Luana is like the person holding the clipboard with the VIP backstage passes. You got to get on the list or you can't get in. <laughs> that's where <laughs> the title came from. Um, but I, so yeah, so the principal showed up and we had this conversation and, and I, and at some point Jennifer said, oh, they're telling me it's L E not a L principle, like a mathematical principle. Yeah, yeah. And then went into detail about what that was about, but ultimately was describing themselves as a guardian. So I called the interview guardian of the galaxy, but at some point, as I'm asking questions, I realized everything this person was saying about who they are over there, non-incarnating individual, I said, has anybody else seen you or chatted with you before? You see, like a detective, I'm Columbo. Yeah, I ask the yeah. questions. The principal said, yes, Buddha. <clears throat> Most people would go, not me. <laughs> I say, well, let me clarify. Are you saying that when Buddha had his moment, his uh, enlightenment moment under the Bodhi tree, that's when he met you? This person said, yes, that's correct. Um, I should stop saying it. <laughs> and so I said, well, in the story of Buddha, he said that he met some non-incarnating deities or non-incarnating individuals, beings. At that point, I said, would, would a human consider you to be, what word would a human use to, you know, if they ran into you? And Jennifer said, I'm getting angel. Don't freeze, no freezing. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I don't judge the question. I mean, I led her to that answer, obviously, because I'm thinking to myself, oh, this is a non reincarnating individual <clears throat> the ones i've spoken to are called angels and i said <clears throat> excuse me i said are you calling yourself a regular normal angel run-of-the-mill average you can use those terms or are you an archangel because i've had interviews with both people had self-identified i'm not saying they were archangels i'm saying whoever i was talking to self-identified as an archangel, let's just call it that. <clears throat> and this person said no. Could have said yes. Could have said, yeah, yeah, I'm Gabriel. I could have said, but not, did not. And Jennifer and I have had conversations with people who self-identified as Michael, as Gabriel, as others. This person, the principal, did not. And then I said, okay, so what's the purpose of your journey? Why are you, how do you, why do you exist? What do you do? What's your, what's your gig? And it was guardian, guardianship, guardianship of the universe. Jennifer kept saying, I'm, they're showing me like this 360 degree view of space, which I take to mean everything that we know in outer space. I mean, I could be wrong. He could, he could be just guarding a sector. I don't know. You have to, you can ask. That's the weird thing of this research. I'll probably ask him this week <clears throat> more questions because we only had about a 45 minute conversation and it was out there yeah what's your take what's your take on angels what do you what's your experience um, i've i've interviewed um several people who claim to to be able to see them um i don't know if you've heard of of the late irish lady called um lorna Byrne at all no but <clears throat> i love the idea yeah yeah it was, well she's written several books <laughs> see you said angel <laughs> yeah so well, you're, not, you're not allowed to talk about them. Yeah, you can do. We'll call yeah. them A. She's written books about <laughs> these A's. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, she she 
uh, claims that she can see angels just like she can see any other people and has conversations with them, etc. And she's got quite a following worldwide now. She's been to America several times and um, she's written several books. Uh, her, her main yeah. thing is that everyone has got their own personal guardian angel um, who looks after them. Whether you can say that's the same as a spirit guide, I don't know. But, um, you know, that, that's partly what she's saying. And she has visions of the future and talks about what's going to happen in the future and, and so on. But she's from a Catholic background, so that influences the way she sees things, I would say. Well, let's allow. Let's mm. just allow. Let's just start mm. there. Allow. And what I try to do is... You compare stories. So if you have one person saying these things, mm. and then another person comes along and says something slightly different, it appears it appears this way that not any person has omniscience. They have a perspective, and from her perspective, that she's had this experience is her perspective. It's not right or wrong. It's just hers. I would offer that anybody can ask questions to anyone who shows up in their presence. The trick is to not judge the answers. That's where the Catholicism comes in. Because when you're judging syntax, um, you know, uh, my, in my case, when I run into an angel or somebody who says they see an angel, I say, can we can go over there and see if you can touch their wings? Ask them, is it okay? And while they're standing there... <clears throat> person reaches over and feels and then describes that you know are you what do you feel and they say oh it feels like uh flocking like cloth but different or the texture and then i'll ask the angel is this an actual physical thing or is this a metaphor for the speed at which you travel and they usually go ding that the wings represent two things one is so you know who they are you know, you walk in wearing a Cubs baseball cap, you know, oh, there's a Cub fan. One. And the other one is they represent their ability to move at the speed of thought. Wings. They fly mm. everywhere. You know, that. let's just allow that. Okay, that's fine. But each one you see is unique. They're not all the same creature. Yeah, yeah. Octopus. But they are. Because we are all made of the same consciousness. So you could argue that we all are. We are the angel. There's a reason they're coming to see us, because they know us. Not like they got nothing better to do. They got plenty to do. Why are they showing up to have a conversation? We tend to do a human-centric thing of going, oh, well, I must be important, because and there's an <laughs> angel in my room. Which is fine. Yeah. Maybe we are. Yeah. It's okay. But my point is, try not to judge. Try, it's very hard to just drop judgment and say, what's the content of what you're saying? Is And I always go to the next step, which is, how do we help the planet? You have, now, I would offer that the future is not set. However, people who can fly have a better perspective. They can see likely outcomes. Yeah, yeah. Because we have free will we often change our minds about what we were going to do moment to moment, let alone week to week, let alone year to year. That's why Edgar Casey was so inaccurate, according to Edgar, when I interviewed him. I said, why were you so inaccurate in all your books? I mean, you were so accurate about health issues, but so inaccurate when it came to prediction of the future. And he said the words. They were likely outcomes. I saw hmm. them as likely outcomes. They just didn't occur that way. Yeah. So... <clears throat> Predicting the future, telling the future, I full stop on that one. There is no future until we make it. There are likely outcomes, so take it with a grain of salt. Also, if you got to know everything that was going to happen, what kind of play would that be? When you go to the theater and you buy a ticket and you're like, the whole time you're shouting, I know what happens next. He <laughs> kills her. Hey, watch out. She's going to die. You know, I mean, how annoying mm. is that? So, yeah. Mm. Come to enjoy the pizza. Come to enjoy the cappuccino. Don't think about so much that, you know, guide yourself with what's going to happen tomorrow. Where's my next pizza going to be? Where's my next cappuccino going to be? Think about what's in front of you. The people that you chose to be with, that chose to love, 
to chose to learn lessons from, to give love to. And love, this weird love thing. You know, you try to look up love in a science dictionary, it doesn't exist. There is no such thing. I mean, they have no definition scientifically mm. of love. We can argue what it is. We can point to people who've had the experience of love. They know it. People who've never had love don't know it. Does it exist? Obviously. But what is it? And what I've heard consistently, because people talk about once they go home, they experience unconditional love. When they first said it, I was like, oh, yeah, I know what that is. But then I thought, why do I know what that is? It, unconditional love is not really on the planet. It's not really on the pulpit. It's not in movies. It's not in books. But we all know what it means. Some people have it with animals. Some parents, some family members, not all. But I hear it consistently. If you can open your heart to everyone, you can experience God. If you open your heart to everyone and all things, that's how to experience God. If that's true, and I heard this from a guide, it's in the book, It's a Wonderful Afterlife. If that's true, then how simple is that? All you got to do is open up your heart, unconditional love, to everyone and all things. It's funny to say it because it's impossible to do. We just can't do it. We spend so much time parsing who said what is who am I, bada ba boop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think bada ba boop has ever been in a sentence related to God, but it you've just heard it now. But anyway, yeah. you see what I'm saying? Love yeah, yeah. appears to be the engine of consciousness, the engine of the universe. Love is God. God is love. Love is consciousness. Consciousness is the thing that we can't define, which connects us all together. Another word is love. In, uh, in the most unusual uh, book review I've had was when we asked Robin Williams to contribute to the book review of Hacking the Afterlife from the flip side. And we asked Robin, is there anything I can put on the cover of the book? That's a quote from you about the book, because he had been a chapter in the book and then I'd taken it out because I thought, mm -hmm. oh, this is about my relationship with yeah. Robin and how I knew him and blah, blah, blah. And then I'm meeting with Jennifer and she said, Robin Williams is here and he wants you to put the chapter back in. She didn't know there was a chapter about him mm -hmm. in the book. It was so weird. Anyway, so I asked him for a review and his review was love, love. Mm -hmm. Love what love is. Love why, why, love why you're on the planet. Love yourself. Love the love that you can give to others. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. It's almost like a fractal. Love, love. It's a key and it's an engine at the same time. So I'm going to give that to Robin. <laughs> it's his book. <laughs> love, love. <laughs> so yeah. I would offer that you should, you know, check out this um, Helen Wamba past life regression on martini zone it's free anybody yeah, yeah. can do game. It. it's a game think of it as a game don't take it so dang seriously think of it as a game you're going to play a game with your mind it's like doing push-ups but for your brain like meditate people get scared of this word meditation literally latin med measure you're measuring reality you're measuring experience learn to meditate not just because it's cool but because it can cure or alleviate symptoms of depression, according to the science. Meditation is a way of examining why we're on the planet. It's the simplest thing in the world to do. You can count your breath every day for 10 minutes. And eventually, you're going to start opening up those filters and getting messages from the people who need to talk to you. Yeah. Those guides and teachers... Now, I do this in my sessions, which is as it ends, I, I, I say to people on the council, is there um, a sensation that you can put in our friend here that they can feel, that they will know is you reaching out to them, their guide or their teacher or their council member? 
And I pause until they say, I mean, sometimes people go, well, I'm not getting anything. But the majority of them say, yeah, I'm getting this weird tingling feeling in my left foot or, or my heart. I feel a pressure or something weird in the back of my neck. Whatever that is, ask your guides for a sensation that allows you to realize that's their bat signal to let you know that you're connected. I get it in the back of my neck. Suddenly I get this chill. I mean, I've had it most of my life, but one day I had, uh, I was working on the Charles Roden show. I mentioned I went to New York to produce that show after my friend died. And I, we invited James Von Prague, uh, you know, the renowned medium, onto the show. And my friend Charles Grodin is a skeptic, but like you, open. And he said, sure, let's bring him on. He said, let's see if we can talk to Luana, who had just passed away. It's on my website, Martini Zone. There he is on camera. I called in from my home in Santa Monica. Friend Prague didn't know it was me. Grodin did. And I said to James, I need to talk to my friend Luana. And he said, oh, she's telling me there's a photograph on your refrigerator that's the essence of your relationship. I've never spoken to a photograph before or since, but when I put that picture of us in Rome having cappuccino and cookies, I said, oh, look, Lou, the essence of our relationship. And there's James von Prague saying it live on air. And at that moment, a huge gong went off in my head. She still exists. It won't prove it to anybody else. No. But it proved it to me. Yeah. And so, therefore, that's part of the reason we've gone on this long journey and trip. But your loved ones still exist. They want to speak to you. They want you to figure out how to open yourself up to hear them. And you're doing it. You're helping them. You. <laughs> where are you anyway? Sorry, where where am I? Yeah. Physically or spiritually or No, no, physically. <laughs> yeah. On the planet. Yeah, I'm in England, near London. Near north, yeah. south, east, east, west. East east of London. You're an East Londoner. Right. No, further out than that. Oh, Essex. Further. Essex. 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 All right, you, you know, could have said that. You could yeah. have just done Essex and you know, it's yeah, part of the because you um, did a session with Tony Stockwell, didn't you, um, in your last book? I did. I did. Yeah. And poor Tony. Tony came out for a visit. Friend, We have a mutual friend. I took him over to Paramount Studios to give him a tour. And I just casually said, you know, do you mind if we do something like this? I say poor Tony because I had my camera with me. And I didn't know he would go anywhere. He didn't. Uh, he'd never heard of this. <clears throat> I asked him specifically... Um, with the first moment he knew in his life that he had the ability to talk to people on the other side. And he said it was a, you know, a small boy had appeared in his room when he was a kid. And I asked the simple question, have you ever talked to that kid since? And he said, no. And I said, would you like to? And he looked at me like, what are you talking about? And I said, and he, and he even said, it doesn't really work that way. I mean, the way he works, you know, he opens himself up, he gets the answers. And I'm saying, would you like to talk to that kid? That was in your room when you were a kid that you saw in the shadow and he said okay and we had this epic adventure that we went together i filmed it and i actually you know i put it in the book but but then i put it online um briefly because i just thought it's so powerful but he tony was like no i don't really like that being online because i you know it's probably too revelatory i don't know what it mm. is mm. Listen, but you know i'm just trying to do research here and i took it down because you know i don't want to upset him in any way he's a fantastic medium he teaches people he knows what he's doing he's you know really top drawer my only thing with him was just to find out how did you know how did you become how did you talk to spirit and by asking those questions you can go further and you know we talked to tony's counsel we talked to his guides we talked to and if i'd only talked to one person you'd say well you know he's a medium uh, you know that's it's easy for him but in the book i have 49 other people yeah. roughly yeah. where yeah. you know people i've never met who are not mediums who are like you know truck driver it doesn't matter if you had a dream that was vivid chances are we can talk to your counsel 
by way of that dream. Yeah, yeah. And who hasn't had a vivid dream? Really? That's right. But anyway, I, think, I interrupted. Yeah, I think um, we'll call it call it a day now. Um, you've been very patient with all the, the gremlins, etc. But um, uh, my apologies. It's probably no. It's not. It's not your fault. It's, you know, London and Los Angeles. What a difference! But um, you know, we got got through all the that, and it's very been very interesting and open opening of, of everyone's mind. I think people listening in will be very interested in, and we've got all the details of your website and your you're on wikipedia as well and uh, whatever so um sure yeah, thank you thank you ever so much for for doing this interview. Well, you're okay welcome. very good Th thank right, you Mark. for that thanks thanks thank Rich. you and, all and right when cheers. you're in london contact me absolutely yeah, essex yeah. here i come yeah <laughs> all right all right thanks cheers. bob thank, thank, thank you very much okay. cheers cheers